Good morning, Village Church East. My name is Megan Patterson and welcome to my house. It is so wonderful to be worshiping with you this morning, even if it is a little different than usual. I have a few announcements for you this morning, so go ahead and get cozy on your couch and get ready for church. The first is that we will still be having communion this morning. So if you need to take a moment to get up, get your juice, your crackers, your donuts, have them handy nearby, now is a great time to do that. Secondly, I want to make sure that you know that you can still fill out a Connect card, even though we're meeting digitally. The link for this is over on the right on this online services page. If you're new or visiting with us this morning, we'd love to have you click over there and fill out the green I'm new card so that we can connect with you later in the week. And if you have a prayer request or a need that we can meet as a church, then we would love to have you fill out that blue prayer card and we'll make sure that you get taken care of soon. Next, we want to make sure that even in this season of not meeting together, we are still faithfully giving to our church. To those of you who have still been giving, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Again, the way that you can do this is by clicking on the link over to the right. There's a button that looks just like this, and it'll take you to our page where you can give to either our general fund or our Hope for Venezuela campaign. This week and next week are the final weeks to give to this special project. This morning is Palm Sunday, which means we are in the week leading up to Easter. Even though we're not together, we still have a lot of special things up our sleeve. The first is that Pastor Craig and Pastor Michael have been putting together some audio devotionals. These will be launching tomorrow and you'll have one every day from tomorrow until Easter. We'll be taking a look at Jesus this week in Jesus' life through the eyes of his followers. Look for more information soon on how you can get plugged into those devotionals. Also, we are partnering with Village Church of Bartlett in their reimagined extravaganza. Normally they have a really big egg hunt in the middle of Bartlett, but obviously that had to be canceled. So instead, we're gonna go spread Easter cheer by putting eggs in our neighbor's yards. If you haven't yet signed up to egg one of your neighbors, you can do that here online. Just click on the link for the hub over to the right and you'll find everything that you need. Finally, we will still be having a good Friday service, even though it'll be online. You just come right back here this Friday at 7 p.m. and we'll see you there.
nothing shall be impossible your kingdom reigns unstoppable we'll shout your praise forevermore jesus our god unstoppable nothing shall be impossible your kingdom reigns unstoppable we'll shout your praise forevermore jesus our god unstoppable nothing shall be impossible your kingdom reigns unstoppable we'll shout your praise forevermore jesus our god unstoppable nothing shall be impossible your kingdom reigns unstoppable we'll shout your praise forevermore jesus our god unstoppable Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done.
Good morning, Village Church East. It is good to see you this morning. Welcome to Sunday morning. This is the Lord's Day. You're gathered at your house. We're gathered at our house. Uh, everybody's gathered around their televisions, their computer screens. And the reason we are is because we're doing church. And as weird as this time is where we're not with each other in body, we are with each other in spirit and we're all receiving God's word together. Just a few quick things before we begin our study of God's word this morning. I know we've already been singing and participating in the service already, but I want to give you a couple quick things that you can look forward to coming up because God knows we need things to look forward to. I want you to know that there's an announcements tab that is on that side of your computer. And if you press it, it will give you all of the details of things that are coming up. And we're planning a lot of really cool things coming up. Uh, so anytime you want to know like what's what's on the agenda, did we miss anything? What did Craig announce that I forgot because I was drinking coffee? You can click on that announcements tab and catch up to what, what we're going to be doing here in the near future. Also, I want to encourage you, take advantage of our giving tab. This is the tab where we encourage you to con continue to be faithful in your giving. Even though we're not together with each other in body, we are worshiping the Lord in all the same ways. And giving is a very important part of our worship to the Lord. We give back what he has given to us. And uh, we don't try and measure that. We just try and give out of a heart of thanksgiving. This is what pleases the Lord. And so uh, I want to encourage you to stay faithful in your giving. You might want to click on that tab right now and even give right now. That That is your option. Uh, and I want to also encourage you, when you click on that tab, you'll see Hope for Venezuela. When you see Hope for Venezuela, that is the ongoing offering that we're taking. We're sending an offering to Venezuela, to the folks down there through a local church so that they can start up their food ministry again. They've had to cut that off because of so many, quite frankly, terrible things have been happening in the country. Um, they have been feeling the, the, the force of uh, corrupt government and they have not been able to eat. They have not been able to work. Um, a lot of them are trying to escape the country. They can't escape. They can't afford food. And so we are giving an offering to this church, uh, university church down in Venezuela, and they are going to start restart their food program that they had to shut down because of the economy. So we're anxious to gather together what little we can and send it down there to maybe give them a couple of months where they can start blessing their folks down in Venezuela. If you click on that announcement tab right over there, you will see that we have a lot of cool things planned for Easter. Now, before I tell you everything going on for Easter, I wanna tell you we will be doing communion again today. So if you need to assign one of your runners right now to go to the kitchen, now is the time to do it. Go to the kitchen, get yourself some communion uh, supplies, whatever you need, and make sure that those are ready to go. A couple different glasses, crackers, uh, cookies, uh, we used Girl Scout cookies once. Whatever you have available that you can use, we're going to participate in communion together. If you would like a teaching on why that's important to us, uh, you can visit our Facebook site. And there is a video that I did two weeks ago uh, that tells you why that's important to us and why we feel like we want to keep doing this uh, because this is what God would want us to do. All right. Now, while your runners are going to get communion supplies, let me tell you what you can expect this Passion Week. Today's Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Passion Week. This is the week that means the world to us as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus comes through the gates of Jerusalem today and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests, they are all focused in on Jesus Christ because they want to kill him at this point. He is way too popular for them. They are losing their fame. They are losing their power and he is gaining it and it has hit them strong. And so over these next few days up to uh, the end of the week, they are plotting against Jesus and they find a friend in Judas and he decides that he's going to plot with them against Jesus Christ. He betrays Jesus. You know the story. But every week, every year when we get to this week, we want to celebrate this as if it is a epitome of, of the story of our salvation, because that's exactly what it is. By the end of this week, Jesus goes from a crowd of adoring worshipers to a throng of criticizing and angry mobs who would cry out for his blood. He would be tried, he would be killed, he would go into the tomb for three days, 
and then he would rise again on the third day. That's Easter Sunday. That's next Sunday. And we have some cool things planned for that as well. But every day this week, we want to give you an insight into what is going on in the disciples' lives as they follow Jesus around. And so we have put together a podcast, just audio, five to six minute uh, sessions each day to kind of let you know what Jesus is going through each one of these days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, what his disciples are going through on those days as well. This is our, our attempt, uh, uh, attempt to get you to walk up to the cross with Jesus Christ. And so I hope you'll take advantage of that. Friday, we are having a Good Friday service. It's an amazing message that just flowed as I was putting it together. Uh, Michael and I worked on this thing, and I'm, I'm very excited. So we will have a Good Friday service, 7 o'clock. And then Egg Hunt on Saturday. You're going to love the Egg Hunt that we're uh, planning for, for the church. All the details are on the Announcements tab. I won't go into all of them now. Uh, but you can bless your neighbors with a big bag of eggs. And I hope you'll take advantage of that. And then Easter Sunday. All right. Now... To the message. Before we start, pray with me. God bless us as we look into your word. May you give us incredible insight as we revisit the story of Moses, this event that occurred so many years ago, but is so applicable to us today. Clear our minds, clear our hearts. Let us give you truly this moment, which is yours. May we focus on what you would have for us. May we move aside the distractions. In Jesus' name, amen. Finally, one more thing I need to tell you. You can look right below here and you will see a chat area. And we would love for you to sign in and let us know that you're there. Please use your real name. Some of, some of us have weird names for, I do too, for my uh, email. Uh, so sign in with your real name just so we know that you're there. And uh, we, we would love to see you chatting back and forth about how the Lord is speaking to you through this message. Now, have you ever had a knee-jerk reaction? Some of us have knee-jerk reactions quite a few times, maybe quite a few times a day. For me, it was this past week. I went into the kitchen to cook uh, some food for dinner, and I, I, had, um, I had just finished up a project that I was working on. So I was in kind of a hurry and the girls were in the kitchen and they were baking and they were knee deep in ingredients and following recipes. And I saw on the stove that there was a pile of pans. Now, one thing you may not know about the Jarvis family is we, we store our pans in the oven. And so sometimes we forget to take those pans out of the oven when we turn the oven on. Well, that was the case here. I, however, did not know that. And I was reminded of what a knee-jerk reaction is all about. When I grabbed the bottom pan of that pile of pans on top of the stove and went to move it, apparently these pans had been in the oven for quite some time and just freshly taken out. The girls had forgotten to take them out, so they were piping hot. The bottom pan was a cast iron pan. And so when I grabbed it, you know, cast iron pan, you got to give it a little, little sugar to get it up. So I grabbed it fairly forcefully and picked it up so I could get all the rest of the pans up. And it seemed like a lifetime that my brain took to register that what I had just gripped onto with all my might was piping hot, red hot. And I took my hand off and it, the pain shot directly into my brain. I ran into the bathroom. I turned on the cold water. I put my hand under the water, praying to God that the pain would stop. And I looked, I looked at my hand and I, I thought, and I could see all of the areas that it was, that it had affected. So my fingers to my, the palm of my hand to my thumb, it had been, it, 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 I had gripped the entire handle of that cast iron pan. And I thought for sure that I would get a blister. Beth, Beth was very worried. She called the doctor and I don't want to go to the doctor now. Nobody does. Nobody wants to go to the hospital. Uh, but we asked, you know, what should we do? How should we treat this thing? And so I immediately just began putting ice on it. And I think the Lord was very gracious because I, I, my hand was just constantly in ice and constantly numb. Literally for the next 12 hours, I did nothing but grab onto a bag of ice. Bag after bag as they melted, they melted into my hand. And, and uh, I've got some scarring, but, but uh, I, there was no blistering. There doesn't look like there's any long-term effect. It was interesting because it was 15 hours before the pain went away. 
I, it reminded me of sometimes we have knee-jerk reactions that are actually good. They are kind of inbred inside of us. We don't have to think a lot, a lot about them. They just kind of kick into place. I didn't have to think very long to let go of that pan. Once I felt the burn, my body kicked into gear and I had a knee-jerk reaction and took my hand off the pan. Uh, off the pan. Our knee-jerk reactions don't only kick into gear, however, only when we have pain. We have knee-jerk reactions when we're insulted by others. Sometimes we have knee-jerk reaction when we're disrespected by somebody. Sometimes we have knee-jerk reactions when our actions of love are ignored or overlooked. Sometimes we have knee-jerk reactions when we're accused of something falsely. And the knee-jerk reaction is just like, what comes out of us? And we go, oh, I didn't mean for that. I, I can't believe I said that. I wish I could take that back. But it's a knee-jerk. It's, it's almost like it's inbred waiting to come out. It's like the doctor that takes that little plastic mallet and hits your knee and your foot flies forward. And for some of us, we live by these knee-jerk reactions. I know, I... I have natural knee-jerk reactions whenever I drive by somebody who, who's driving in Illinois. Knee-jerk reactions are emotional. They're not typically thoughtful. They're a direct uh, drive of our emotions and we respond immediately. In times of crisis, what you truly believe determines your knee-jerk reaction. This time of crisis for our world that we're in today is exposing some deep-rooted knee-jerk reactions of people who could otherwise hide it. The facade of the age is being torn down and because of this coronavirus and the, and the, and the pain that it's bringing into people's lives and the fear and the, and, and the, and the anxiety and, and quite frankly, the brokenness, people are tending to respond with their most base desires, their deepest knee-jerk reactions. And as coronavirus exposes what's already there, it may be exposing something that actually has been dormant even for some time, but a dormant bear is still a bear. For the church, this is our time to shine. Our mantra is typically, Jesus brings life to a dying world through his sacrifice on the cross. This is what we proclaim. This is, this is our message to the world. And that message is now ringing across the globe like never before. You need to know, if you don't know this, people are giving their lives to Jesus left and right. And if you're joining us here and you're just thinking to yourself, I'm just curious, I don't know what this whole church thing is about or what Village East is all about. I don't know this church. I don't know that guy that's talking right now. You're in a good place. I don't, I, my goal is not to make anybody feel uncomfortable, but simply preach the truth of Jesus Christ that's always been, and it's always been the same. And that is that God exists to give us hope. In times of crisis, what you really believe determines your knee-jerk reactions. And there's so many revealing knee-jerk reactions in the story of Moses today. We get back to the story of Moses, and Moses now is, is, is come across the Sinai Peninsula. He's entered back into Egypt. He's met up with Aaron. His family's on board. Jethro, his father-in-law, is on board. He's, he's, he's dedicated his whole family to the Lord. It looks like things are finally going to pan out for Moses. And then he goes to the elders, who he told God would never believe him. And he tells them, God has sent me to set you free. It's time for you to be freed. And the response from the elders was a knee-jerk reaction. In verse 31, I mean, how would you react if somebody told you after 400 years of slavery, I'm here because God sent me to set you free? Here's their knee-jerk reaction. The people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshiped. Now that is a good knee-jerk reaction. Finally, God has seen and heard and will respond. But... Now the war begins. Moses in Exodus 5 has to go revisit his brother, now Pharaoh of Egypt, this brother that he had grown up with, now in a totally different manner. Verse 1 of Exodus 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, 
Let my, let's say it together, this is great. Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Now the question is, what is Pharaoh's knee-jerk reaction to this going to be? <laughs> and if you thought, probably not good, then you are tracking perfectly with the story. Now, I'm thinking to myself, Pharaoh might be glad to see Moses. He may not know what Moses has to say. He might see Moses and say, hey, Moses, it's good to see you. Let's have lunch. Let's catch up. Meet my family. You haven't met them yet. Tell me about yours. It might be a moment when these two could reunite. Maybe Pharaoh would be at least curious to know why Moses is back after 40 years. But he never expected to hear this demand. He never expected to hear this demand from Moses. And to back it up by saying, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go. You see, Pharaoh viewed himself as the mouthpiece of the gods of Egypt. The gods don't speak unless they speak through Pharaoh. The gods are Pharaoh's friends. And no gods that Pharaoh worshipped told him to let the people go. So who's Moses to come back after 40 years with a bunch of sheep and tell him it's time to let these people go? What do you think his reaction is going to be? Well, you might have guessed it. Verse 2. But Pharaoh said, and this is the worst thing I have ever read in Scripture, I believe. Who, these four words, who is the Lord? You know what that says? Who's this guy? Who's this? This guy means nothing to me. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I won't let the people go. Pharaoh's knee-jerk reaction was defiance. It was to defy God's command. Now, please understand, he's willing to listen. He's just not willing to obey. He listened to what Moses said, but then he said, mm, who is God that I should bow the knee to him? This God is nothing. I don't know this God. This is a clear knee-jerk reaction. He took no time to think this over. Pharaoh didn't say, okay, Moses, hang on a second. Just explain to me, how did you meet this God? And is it another God that we should adopt in Egypt? And tell me who, how about this burning bush thing. Moses didn't share any of that. Pharaoh didn't ask. Pharaoh's knee-jerk reaction was, who is God that I should obey him? You see, Pharaoh's knee-jerk reaction exposed a deep-seated belief that he had had for years. A lie that Pharaoh had grown up with, and this is the lie. No one judges me but me. I live like I want to. I answer to no one. And when this life is over, I'm going to answer to the gods that I constructed during the time I was alive. This is the lie that people believe when they don't believe there's a God who, ha who has a reckoning for them someday. This is the lie people convince themselves into in order to live like there's no consequences to what they do. And this is precisely the group that God speaks to in 1 Peter 4, 5 when he writes this, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. There's only one way out for people who believe this way. And listen, you might be there. With this format speaking to, to you over, over a digital media in my house, I don't know who's listening. But I got to think there's somebody out there that's listening that might be in this knee-jerk reaction mode. Who's God that I should pay attention to him? Prove to me that there's a God. Show me there's a day of reckoning. Then I'll believe it. But some things are true whether you believe in them or not. Some things are true whether you see them or not. And so I got to tell you that you must adopt this time and use it well and run to Jesus Christ. Only Jesus has the power to cover our sins and give us a right standing with the Father. Only Jesus Christ. You have to surrender that deep-seated belief, that rebellious belief that comes out of those defiant attitudes. And I don't know, maybe during this time of coronavirus anxiety, that has been exposed in you. But whatever it is that you that you need to, 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 to give up and surrender, you have to do that today. Today is the day of salvation. You have the ability now to surrender to Jesus Christ and his authority over your life.
And the Bible is full of references. That's just one. But it's full of references that indicate to us that we will have a day of reckoning. However, if you come to Jesus Christ and you give your sins to him, he will take them and he will eradicate them. And he will view you as washed, cleaned, and pure. Romans 4, 7 says this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. I love that. Because unlike, uh, unlike uh, people in the world that believe there's no day of reckoning, I believe that there is. And I believe that I have sins in my heart that I can't get rid of. Only one person can do that, and that is the holy person, Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross this week, this Passion Week, he didn't do it because he was bored. He did it because that was his mission. His mission was to come and seek and save those who are lost, and I was one of those people. And I had to, in my life, bow down and give my life to Jesus Christ, and now I serve him with my life. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a missionary. You don't have to... I don't have to do anything like that. I don't know what the Lord has for you in his future, but I do know this, you have to bow. Every knee someday will bow. It's best to do it now. Blessed are those whose sins the Lord do not count against them. Only Jesus can forgive. That's who you need. Listen, there are no good people in heaven. There's only forgiven ones. And so I encourage you to ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. Well, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to demonstrate that we have a deep heart of compassion for people who have yet to know Jesus Christ. Pharaoh couldn't care less about God, but that did not make him free of the charges. He was still responsible to let God's people go because that's what God told him to do. Just because you don't know doesn't mean you're not responsible. <laughs> Try telling a police officer that. When you're driving through town and there's no posted signs about the speed limit and you're going over and then you have a conversation with him in the car and explain to him, I didn't know, mm, you're still getting a ticket. God's word is still God's word and the law is still God's law. Well, Pharaoh is so angry with God's demands. He's so angry that he decides to make the lives of the Israelites even more difficult before his own men had gone out, his own workforce had gone out and got them the materials they need to build bricks, to actually forge the bricks, to build, to construct things. But Pharaoh loses it. He says, oh, you have time to go on picnics to worship Yahweh. Oh, you have time to gather your own materials then to build the stuff I want you to build. And that's exactly what he does. Verse six, the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and get the straw for, the, <laughs> for themselves. They are idle. Let heavier work be laid on men, on the men that they might labor at it and pay no regard to their lying words. He made their lives more difficult. He literally began working them to death. So let me ask you, what do you think the people's knee-jerk reaction is going to be to Moses and Aaron? You might have guessed it. Verse 20, Then the elders of Israel met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them. As they came out from Pharaoh, they had just gone into Pharaoh and begged Pharaoh, please don't make us have to do all this extra work. We're dying here. And Pharaoh said, if you got time for picnics, you got time to work harder. So they come out. They find Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them after they had met with Pharaoh. And they said to them, verse 21, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. The people's knee-jerk reaction to Moses and Aaron, to God's plan, was straight-up anger. The elders went in and they begged Pharaoh for mercy. And he told them to go literally pound more sand. Their deep-seated beliefs was exposed through this knee-jerk reaction to their crisis. I remind you, in times of crisis, what you truly believe 
determines your knee-jerk reaction. Listen, just 20 verses ago, Aaron Moses showed up and they heard the message, we're going to be free. And they bowed down and they worshiped. That was their <coughs> knee-jerk reaction. But now their knee-jerk reaction is not to worship. Now it's just anger. What made the difference? They just wanted the pain to stop. And they would have gladly, the irony is they would have gladly gone back to just being slaves with a normal routine at this point, then deal with this heightened situation. The people's knee-jerk reaction displayed a deep-seated belief that had been building in them for the last 400 years. And here's what it is. God exists to make my life better. Now, does that sound familiar? <laughs> Some of us have this knee-jerk reaction to God. We think that he's our genie we rub, and he exists so that my life can get better. And if my life doesn't get better, God must be sleeping or not paying attention or he doesn't love me. You see, that all exposes a knee-jerk reaction, deep-seated lie that we believe that God exists to make my life better. This God was only making their lives worse. To the point where when we get to the next chapter, they wouldn't even listen to Moses and Aaron anymore. Look in 6 and verse 9. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. But look at this. They did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and the harsh slavery. At least Pharaoh listened to Moses' spiel. But these Israelites, they were so broken. They put their fingers in their ears and they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't even listen to Moses anymore. So we know Moses now. What do you think Moses' knee-jerk reaction is going to be to all of this story that God has planned out as it plays out. Look in verse 22. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to these people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. You see, Moses is exposing a deep-seated belief in his life as well. And that deep-seated belief is simply this, doubt. Maybe God's not going to be able to pull us off. When he sees his brother as Pharaoh, I can't even imagine what, through, what went through his mind. But I have to believe it was some sort of a depressing moment. How is God ever going to pull this off? And what Moses believed this was this lie, God's call should be easy. In church, God's call is hardly ever easy. His burden is light, but his call sometimes are hard. And please note, Mo Moses is the one writing all of this. Moses is the author of this book. He's portraying himself in this, in this doubting context where he's thinking to himself, God may not come through. His ability to trust God was weak, and he penned this on paper. And I think he did so, so that we could understand that uh, some of us may look up to Moses or Abraham or David and think to ourselves, we'll never be like that. But even they had their flaws. All of us, when we get to the point where the rubber meets the road, have the ability to doubt God. In this life, church, our only hope is to run to Jesus Christ. Our only hope is to run to him in time of crisis. And the way that we do that is we prepare before the crisis hits. We learn of Jesus before the crisis arrives. We spend time with Jesus and we prepare our hearts so that whatever's rooted way down deep in here will come out and it'll be something that we can be proud of. We prepare our deep beliefs so that when crisis arrives, our knee-jerk reactions are the right ones. Life will wrap around my my. My life so tightly at times, I could experience moments of excruciating pain. I don't want my knee-jerk reaction to be abandoning my faith in Jesus Christ. I want to be a knee-jerk reaction. I want to have a knee-jerk reaction that would display my truest beliefs that I trust Jesus, even in times of suffering. And I believe Jesus has everything in control, and I believe I am on his side, the winning side. That brings me to so what. The first one is this. I would encourage us as a church, and if you're listening and you're not a part of our church, I would encourage us as believers 
to do some self-reflection during this time. What is deeply, this, this deep isolation, what is, what is this, this horrific news that we hear? What is this deadly disease that we see every day around us and around the globe? What is that revealing in us? What is it revealing about our relationship to our wives or our husbands or our children or, or our friends or our neighbors? What is it revealing deep down inside? And we may not like it. We may not li like to even look at it, but, but what is actually coming out? Because whatever it is, is maybe a knee jerk reaction that God is saying, okay, <laughs> you got to work on this. What is it revealing about our relationship to God? Because whatever needs work is likely being exposed right now. It's like, uh, it's like when my brother and I, we used to bicycle and, and uh, we actually went around Europe for uh, five months. We went to the Middle East, Egypt, we, we bicycled all over the place and I would get flat tires constantly. Uh, and I can remember I'd have to tear the tube out and, and I'd have to figure out where this air was coming out. Sometimes it was a very small hole, usually it was, and I'd hear the leak and I couldn't find the doggone leak and I would just get so frustrated at times. and. And then I learned a trick. And the trick was you could take a little bit of water from your water bottle and you could pour it over your tube and wherever it started bubbling, exposed the hole. And once the hole was exposed, you could cut yourself out a, a little patch and put it on the hole and you could repair your tire. The crisis was wherever the water revealed the crisis to be. And I gotta tell you, I think at this point in our lives, this crisis, this coronavirus is revealing to us things, areas we need to surrender to the Lord. But be encouraged. Please be encouraged. You're not the only one going through this. Every believer goes through this. And if you're looking at somebody else and you're saying, yeah, I'd like to tell you about some areas being exposed in your life, reveal to me. Well, take a closer look at the other person, the one in the mirror. Because maybe God's speaking to you too. You're not alone in this. Even the psalmist who wrote all of these beautiful psalms, 150 incredible psalms written by all of these different psalm writers. We typically think of David, but there was a bunch of them. But even these psalmists wrote this in Psalm 100 139, verse 23. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Can you, can you hear him asking God to pour the water on the tube so it can reveal where the holes are? Knee-jerk responses are always emotional. They're rarely logical, but they're always revealing. Be humble enough to examine yourself and see what areas need work and then work on them. Admit it, give it to God, ask for help, work on it. Number two, in your downtime, feed your faith. <laughs> feed your faith. Now listen, I understand you may need to start the journey. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Uh, on this page right here, right on the, on the side, uh, there's a button right there and it says, um, I want to start my journey. That button is for you. Click on that button and let us know. Hey, hey, listen, I don't even know if I have a relationship with Jesus. And after hearing this, I sure could use one. Click on that button. We uh, we will get those uh, requests, a couple of different questions for you. We'll get them in and you will receive a call this week from somebody who's genuinely concerned about how God's working in your life right now. Maybe you just need to start the journey. You're hearing the air leak out for the first time. You're seeing these 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 this broken part of your life for the very first time. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus Christ, to somebody who can make your burdens lighter. Somebody who will walk with you closer than a brother. And somebody that will love you no matter how many times you drop the ball. Number two, do intentional things to show your faith. This is the time to do it. Have you always wanted to do devotions with your kids at home? You got the time. <laughs> have you always wanted to have time for Bible reading just 10 minutes a day? You do now. Always wanted to help your neighbor or, or, or know if, you're really, if they really needed help? They do now. Always wanted to pray better and with real purpose, you can now. Get it? This is a crisis moment that is revealing areas that you can learn to follow God deeper, to give Jesus more of your attention. I tell you this, if you feed your faith, your fears will starve. But if you feed your fears, 
your faith will starve. Fear feeding is natural. So do intentional things that feed your faith. Number three, as things get more difficult, church, trust God. Trust God. This is easy to say, but hard to do. But this is where your power comes from. You remember I said at the beginning, this is Palm Sunday. Jesus is about to have his crucifixion in five short days. This week is full of ups and downs, and it reveals so many hearts. Today, this group that is crowded around Jesus Christ, throwing palm branches and cloaks in his way as he comes through the gates of Jerusalem, these people are about to have their hearts revealed in some pretty nasty ways. Today, they're, they're applauding Jesus as a conqueror, somebody that can save them from Rome, somebody that can give them their land back, somebody that can get rid of these Gentiles that have taken over their property, somebody that can make their lives better, <laughs> somebody that can make their lives easier, somebody who can not call on their hidden deeds and bring them to light. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like everybody that we just studied. How do I know this? Because in four short days, this same crowd that cried out in worship to Jesus will cry out for his blood. They didn't believe his message, not really. They believed it because of what they could get or what they thought they could get out of it. They had deep-seated lies that they believed that would be exposed later on in the week. They believe what they wanted to believe about Jesus and their knee-jerk reactions on that Sunday demonstrated it. At one point when Jesus was with his disciples in John chapter 6, at this point in ministry where persecution was growing, Jesus began losing disciples. People began hearing rumors that the Romans are coming for you or the high priest has his eyes on you or the chief priests are fed up with you or the Sadducees are getting together and cooperating on how they can get rid of Jesus and they're going after his followers too. And when his followers heard this, they began leaving. John the Baptist had just been beheaded. These false spiritual leaders of the day had decided that they, if they take off the head of the movement, the rest of the movement would, would fall. And as the disciples began hearing these rumors, they began abandoning Jesus Christ. Jesus' disciples left in large numbers. And there's a verse in John 6 that starts like this. After many of his disciples turned their backs and no longer walked with him, they realized this was more that they, than they signed up for. Their knee-jerk reaction was to run when their lives were in danger. Then Jesus looks at his 12 faithful disciples and he addresses them directly. And he said, do you want to go away as well? In other words, will you stay with me through the rest of this journey? How committed are you? How deep does your faith go? What lies have been exposed? What have you surrendered? And how much do you love me? Can you endure the fear of an uncertain future? Or will your knee-jerk reaction be to run like the rest of your brothers? Simon Peter comes up with a brilliant response. He answered him and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of life. Powerful, powerful statement. And church, in times of crisis, what you truly believe determines your knee-jerk reactions. So church, I would say, this is our time to shine. We are surrounded by people demonstrating knee-jerk revealing behavior Defiant behavior like Pharaoh. Who's God to judge me like this? Angry behavior. Why is God making my life so hard like the Israelites? Why is my life not getting better? Questioning behavior like Moses. Why is my life with God so difficult? Why isn't God making this easier? But some church, some will listen some are ready to receive. And some of you listening right now are ready to receive and give your life to Jesus Christ. You are in good company. You, you are right where God needs you to be and your heart is being exposed. It is painful. It is not fun. 
but it will grow you and give you hope, not only in this life, but the life to come. I saw a newscast not that long time, not that long ago, a couple of days ago, Monday night of this week, actually. A broadcast host at MSNBC was interviewing a pastor about the coronavirus. He stopped in the middle of the broadcast and he said these words, I've never done this before. I've never done this on the air. And then he asked the pastor to pray. And the pastor bowed his head and he prayed. He prayed for the doctors. He prayed for the nurses. He prayed for the first responders. He even prayed for the news anchor. And then he prayed for peace. Church, this is our time to shine. We are in this place for such a time as this. Our response is not fear. It's not anxiety. It's not hopelessness. Our response is we bring, either this is real or it's just a game we're playing. And our response is to bring peace to those who are broken, to those who are in fear. Isaiah 26, three says this, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. God is in perfect control. He was in Moses' situation. He is every day of your life, and he is in this situation. You can trust him. And more than that, church, you can praise him, just like the people this day in Palm Sunday, because you know Jesus is your only hope in good times, in bad times, and in every time in between. So the question is, will you go away as well? And my answer is, <laughs> Lord, where else shall we go? You alone have the words of life. Let's pray. So God, we come to the end of this very, very applicable passage of scripture, thinking to ourselves, we need help and our help comes from the Lord. Remind us as a church, that this is not just something we preach on Sunday. This is something we live every day and take the church into the world that is crying for hope. And may we be the church as we are not gathered as the church in the same building, but sent into the world to be the church. So Father, may you expose continually things in our, our lives that we still need work as well. And may we be the best examples of your hands and your heart and your eyes to those around us in desperate need of hope and love. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's praise the Lord together, and then we're gonna take communion.
We come to our time of communion. This is our moment to celebrate our ability through Jesus Christ to have a relationship with a holy God. I am so thrilled that we get to do this, even though we're apart from one another, because of the meaning that it holds. And that is, it exposes in us our need to, to have Jesus Christ's blood applied to our sins. If you've joined us this morning and thinking to yourself, well, these people seem to have it all together, you'd be wrong. <laughs> the one thing we have in common is that we're all sinners who believe we've been saved by grace. That means we haven't done anything to deserve it. Jesus has given his own life voluntarily. He is the lamb that came to wash the sins of the world away. He is God the Father's lamb brought through the gates of Jerusalem on this day 2,000 years ago. On Palm Sunday, God presented his lamb. And by the end of the week, this lamb would be sacrificed, accused falsely, and voluntarily give his life. He was not forced to. There was, there was a plot against his life, but he came voluntarily to the cross. He walked that road bearing his own cross. He allowed those men to put the, the, the nails in his hand and his feet. And he told Pilate, you wouldn't have any ability to even take my life unless I gave it to you. So church, we come to this moment with great solemn awareness. Jesus did all of this for me and for you. Communion is simply the celebration that we commune with one another because of Jesus Christ and we commune with God because of Jesus Christ. It's all because of him. Because of his blood, we get to be one family. We get to be one family with his blood joining us together. And because of his blood, we get to be forgiven and have God, a holy God, as our father. When you take the juice, it's a reminder that it's the blood of Jesus that forgives us for our sins. That it's, it's this holy blood of Jesus Christ, the only thing that could wash away our sins. And when you eat the bread, it's a reminder that Jesus physically had to die. So I'm here to tell you that I believe this communion celebrates the fact Jesus came, voluntarily gave his life, died a physical death, was buried in a physical tomb, and rose three days later in a physical body, so much so that when they went to look for him, they couldn't find him. There's no body in the tomb. It's an empty grave. We celebrate that next Sunday, big time. But for now, I want to take you to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth and reminds them to keep doing communion because it's a reminder to us of what it takes for us to be made right with God. He writes, For I received from the Lord what also I delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, church, I'd like to take this moment, grab your piece of bread and your juice, and would you remember what it took for us to be right with God by eating and drinking in remembrance of Jesus Christ? It has been an awesome privilege to be invited into your homes. I know we're not there in person, but our family, like yours, has worshiped the Lord this morning with you. We have taken communion together with you. And we have done this because we are a church with you. Whether you're a part of VCE, Village Church East, or you're a part of the global church around the world, we are brothers and sisters. And it has been such a privilege to open God's word with you and to hear him speak to my heart as I pray that he has spoken to yours. If you need to follow up, please do so. All these buttons on the side here, these are all for you. Take advantage of them. Find out what we're doing as a church. Get involved in your community through the 
uh, egg your neighbor uh, activity that we're going to be doing on Saturday. You can read all about it. Uh, ways that you can bless your neighborhood. Um, listen to the devotionals that are starting tomorrow. Uh, those are going to be amazing devotionals, short each day. And you can find all of them uh, with, with the buttons here on the side, or you can go to our website at vceast.org. I'm anxious to see you on Friday night. It'll be our next meeting that we have together. We will uh, spend some time reflecting on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's Good Friday. And uh, they call it Good Friday for a reason, but I'll let you wait until then to find out. Until then, church, it is my awesome privilege to have shepherded you this morning and loved on you a little bit and shared in this time of worship. May God bless you and may you be a blessing to everyone sitting around you and outside of your walls. God bless you, church.